be, uh, in case you're new, thank you, Donald. Uh, we're, this is the note well. Please take a look at it. If uh, And we'll start uh, with that as the introduction. And I'll start in just a few minutes. Good morning, Jeffrey. Jeff, you've been busy. Good morning, Sue. Good morning. I think I'm going to give a few minutes after the hour and see if we uh, have anyone else who join us. But if not, they've got plenty of interested people. Well, let's get started. I'll at least start with the agenda. Good morning, Xuping. Good morning, Wei. Uh, let me, this is the note well, if you are new in working with the ITF, uh, you should read the note well. I note that Donald and Xuping and Wei are uh, good long-term uh, participants. So, I think you can glance at it and go from there. In the meantime, let me load the slide deck, which you can download from the uh, piece from the website. Let's see. Okay. So, is the screen seeable at this point, Jeff? It uh, displays fine. OK. So this is a design team. Uh, the first couple minutes will be a bashing in case uh, you want to add something. Uh, Xu Ping, uh, I, I, I uh, may need your help to describe the APN draft. I did load it in case we uh, needed to chat about that. Uh, so. Yeah, sure. I would appreciate it. Um, I believe I'd like to try to, since this is a smaller group, have people describe their uh, introduction. As I just noted, Ping has uh, a flow spec draft related to APN. Uh, Ping, would you like to share any other background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Su. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Xu Ping Peng from Huawei. And uh, basically, in my ETF, I uh, currently focus more on the uh, SRV6, IPv6. And I'm also chairing the dispatch, all dispatch. Uh, yeah, and uh, I have this uh, flow spec draft uh, in the IDR. And uh, it could be a potential use cases. Yep, that's it. Thank you, Sue. 
Thank you so much. Donald, would you like to introduce yourself? <clears throat> I, uh, Donald, I guess I've, I've been involved in uh, flow spec for quite a while. I have some flow spec extension drafts on uh, version one, which are awaiting implementation and have been uh, involved with Sue on uh, the specifying version two. So that's really primarily my involvement. Thank you, Donald. And Nat, would you like to describe your interest? Uh, sure. I well, actually, I uh, um, I am individual contributor right now, and uh, I don't have official support from my employer right now. So, but basically, I work for a carrier, and uh, I have some uh, use case. Uh, I have some use cases from for the flow spec, uh, and uh, we have some uh, well some use cases that might uh, need some uh, extra implementations in this case. So basically, we are pretty interested in the flow spec v2 implementations, and I personally I have. Uh, contributed to the, I think is the TS flow spec SRV6 draft, uh, which is doing some kind of uh, predestination steering for the uh, flow spec filters. Yeah, the, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, you Nan. Juan, would you like to tell us about your interest in flow spec? Maybe one, uh, would you like to say hi? Juan is showing as only a Zulip user, so I suspect he's not really logged yeah, in. He's not online. Jun, Junji, would you like to describe your interest in full spec? Okay, maybe he's also having trouble with the mic. We would you like to, we Pen, would you like to describe uh, how, what your interest in flow spec is? Uh, hi, I actually I'm, I'm, I'm new to this IDR working group and uh, I noticed that there uh, in the agenda in the uh, web page says there is a uh, no, content, uh, active content uh, filter. Uh, related stuff. I am curious about this, so I joined this times uh, meeting. Yeah. That's Welcome. It. We're glad to have you join us. Ren, would you like to, if you can, uh, tell us your interest in flow spec? Ren? Just go ahead and speak if you get a chance. Uh, sorry, Su. Uh, I, I can't hear what you said. I'm late, but the, uh, the network is not very good. Oh, I'm I so just, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, we're glad. I'm glad you're here. Hopefully, the audio is coming through. Thank you. Uh, um, I appreciate you at least trying to say hello. Uh, hi, Bo. Welcome. Thank you. To, you're welcome. Hi, Bo. Welcome to Flow Spec. Did you want to mention a few uh, minutes about your interest in Flow Spec? Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Okay, welcome, Gerard. Are you uh, at uh, um, coming to help us straighten out flow spec? Okay. Hi, Joe. Well, I'm. I 
I'm trying to, with a uh, design team, trying to gauge the interest. I see we have people deploying. So let me go back to, for those who are new, to uh, talk about what we're trying to do with the open parallel design teams. We're trying to hurry along uh, the work because we had CAR and CT, and there's a lot of drafts that have been proposed. Uh, Donald and I have done some uh, flow spec V2 work, but what we got from the implementers when we gave a fairly complete spec was, yes, this is complete, it's logical, but it isn't uh, in good chunks of technology that's easy to deploy. And we'd like to see this deployed and used as uh, a few of you said in your network. So we talked to uh, Gunter, I talked to Jeff and some other people who'd been working on implementations, shipping. And my understanding is that if we broke it into several pieces that added to one another, people would implement it. So we broke the chunks into a basic uh, IP, uh, uh, basic flow spec V2 for IP. And what that is, is we have filters plus the current actions plus ordering, because that's the real problem in adding new specs to flow spec V1, is that the ordering of the, uh, of the user uh, filters uh, was not really doable in flow spec V1. In flow spec V2, we've added an order, and I'll go through how uh, we've done that in the flow spec v2. Then we thought we'd like to add more filters in flow spec v2 uh, because there's a lot of really uh, new work for IP uh, filters in the payloads, filters with the related to the SRV6 in the uh, header. So we'd like to focus on adding that as the first addition to the basic IP. Then we'll tackle doing actions, defining act, more actions and action sequences. The action sequences require us to go to something beyond extended community. Uh, the current actions have extended community which have interactions. And then we'll pick up uh, a lot of fine work that we had on non-IP filters. The reason is there seems to be some uh, strong urgency in getting the IP filters worked through. So what do, why are we taking the four parallel open design teams? Uh, what does it mean? A design team, I'd really like people to read the flow spec work, uh, be ready to discuss it, and complete action items. The idea is we'd like to make sure we have something that people can implement in the basic IP and then add to. Why is it open? Because we're looking for a lot of feedback from implementers, from people deploying it. And so anyone can join the team. So the form is scheduled, uh, the design team is scheduled as an interim. Why are we working on four parallel teams? Because people are really focused usually on one addition or maybe two additions. That way the four teams can operate at the same time. And our focus is to get the chunks ready and we hope we'll have a block of time at 120 to present uh, the chunks and the pros and cons. So I hope uh, all of you are interested in reviewing and talking about drafts. So why did we take the approach? As I mentioned, people have been waiting for flow spec V2 drafts to be standardized, and we're trying to catch up. Why? The CAR CT, uh, the intent-based routing, so the chairs are trying to catch up. So these are the design team meetings. You'll notice that design team one for the basic spec has more meetings than 
others because we're trying to get this very basic initial spec done but we need to get some uh, work done on the others to make sure the original spec is intact. So today is the first design team meeting, which I hope will introduce you to the work. And next week we'll meet again with design team one, which is this basic IP, and design team two, which is the filters. On the 10th, we'll meet uh, with design teams three and four. So. We'll repeat this about a month later uh, and see if we can sort of uh, talk about our progress, uh, both with the basic spec and the then again on the 10th with the review of where we are with more IP filters and continue our discussion for the actions and the non IP. And um, we're going to go ahead and probably meet with three and four after uh, the initial design team. Ah, did you have something? Uh, yeah, so Sue, your microphone seems to have lost your headset. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, just a minute, let me pause it. How is it now? Can you hear me? You're st you're, you are still on open mic. I'm still on open mic. Okay, Jeff, hold on to this. I'll see if I can disconnect it and bring it back. Okay, Sue, we can see you again. Let's see if we can hear you. How is my mic now? Is it better, Jeff? You're back on your microphone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, how far did I not have mic? Did you have mic? Do I need to go back, Jeff? Uh, you had a uh, speaker the entire time, but you did follow up on microphone. Uh, a quick pause, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm being pinged since I let people at IDR know that uh, we do have the design team special sessions running. Uh, just to confirm, this is an open design team session. Anybody is permitted to join. Is that correct? That is correct. This is an open design team. In that case, I will echo that back to IDR. Thank you. I will back this up. It is open. Anyone can join the team, but we ask uh, by selecting it as an open design team that people read the work ahead of time and be ready. This is an exception I'm trying to bring you on speed. There are web pages for this that you can get to off the IDR wiki. 
And just in case you don't know where the IDR Wiki is for our new participants, just a minute, I will post the IDR Wiki page at, uh, at my first break. So you can, it's an open meeting, anyone to join. We want to get feedback from implementers, from people who think they're deploying, from people who are brand new, because maybe we've missed something. Uh, Donald and I have looked at this for a long time. We're running for parallel open design teams to get lots of feedback at specific information. So I hope, and why are we taking this approach? Because uh, the intent routing uh, for BGP took time and we're trying to catch up. So we're trying to take a uh, approach of working. Let's talk about when the design teams meet. We're meeting uh, a phase one to start our work. Today's design team one in an introduction. Next week, we'll pick up again with some of the issues and questions I raise. On the IDR Wiki, you will find that there are, uh, if you go to the IDR Wiki page, you will find that with a open design team uh, background and questions and documents on each design team. The IDR Wiki is at, uh, excuse me, wrong place. I'm going to post it in the chat. If you don't know where the IDR Wiki is, that's uh, go ahead and take a look and click there. We're going to start our work next week. We're going to dig right into Design Team 1's uh, IP Basic and look at filters that would be added afterward. And on May 10th, we will look at uh, action design. There's quite a lot of discussion that needs to be talked about on how to ordering. And Donald and I worked through a lot of issues, but we'd really like to walk through our design and how that impacted some of Donald's work with non-IP filters and actions. Month later, we'll pick up the same thing and review things uh, for the IP basic. And we'll try to make sure that the IP filters that are hot are ready to go for ITF 120. And then we'll keep working on the IP actions. We think it will take a little bit of time in discussions. I'm tending to put most of this as open on the IDR mail list. If it becomes too much, we'll find some other way to handle it. Um, so what's the preliminary draft? And Jeff, am I still on my mic? Loud and clear, Sue. Good. So the initial draft we had was uh, that Donald and I uh, and two other co-authors co uh, are on is the draft flow spec uh, v204 it has a repository of all our information and as we make changes we will keep up the repository but our goal is to have this stay as a working group document where we stare save agreed upon changes the initial draft uh, i released uh, an early one last week and another revision last night um, you will find it has uh, the what I hope is the beginnings of a basic uh, function that we can deploy. We've talked about this with some implementers, but um, Gerard and Weibo and Nat and Ran and Xiping, we just need to see if this is close. I'd love to have any additional drafts on use cases. I mentioned Xiping's. Uh, use of uh, flow spec with the APN. There's especially SRV SIC work that has already been accepted in IDR for flow spec. We really need to know pros and cons of ordering and pros and cons of using both extended communities and user act ordered actions. Or there is an interaction, and I 
put in there some of the thoughts that we had on ordering. And then concepts of group IDs. I see in CATS and APN and in our original internet set draft from IDR, a concept of grouping uh, either a set of prefixes, uh, filters, or a set of interfaces along with prefixes and filters to have a group. And that concept seems to be powerful, but there seems to be a little bit different uh, angle on it in APN CATS, uh, our original interface draft. We don't know if they're unique functions or if there's one thing that we might implement that would be able to work on it. So what uh, the purpose of this original IP basic draft is that it would be required for every flow spec V2 implementation. The key addition in this chunk of V6 flow spec V2 is the user ordering of filters defined by flow spec uh, V2. And by the way, folks, if you have questions, this is an open discussion as we get farther in. Uh, because we would like feedback. I anticipate for the first few minutes that uh, we won't do that. And Jeffrey, let me know if I miss any something in the chat. The initial filters are defined in flow spec V1. And we're going to stay with those filters to make sure we get the user ordering. The initial actions will be flow spec V2 actions plus perhaps one action ordering extension. And that's to deal with one of the things in Donald's and my discussion is what happens when an action fails? What happens when you have interactions? Right now, individual implementations actually try to deal with interactions. One example of interactions is what happens if you have a a uh, action that uh, uh, rate limits by bytes and another that rate limits by packets. That might be what you wanted. That might be totally uh, wrong for your implementation. Uh, so how do we do that? Do we have a, a default ordering for uh, extended community actions plus a way to accept it, that's one way to have the actions. The same true as failure. If you fail to, if you have those two filters again, what happens if one fails? So there are seven questions I've listed on the IDR webpage uh, that I'd like us to try to answer to see if we've got a good basis. Does the user ordering and encoding, encoding support current and emerging use cases. What happens if multiple uh, flow specs uh, are received, filters are received with the same user order value? Uh, do you then order it by, com uh, by components, which is what flow spec V1 does? How should flow spec and flow spec V2 be merged? They're both in NLRIs. Uh, the current uh, flow spec uh, draft that's the working group draft says put flow spec v2 first and then afterwards do flow spec v1. Um, the idea is that flow spec v2 would be user ordered and flow spec v1 could be added on top. What happens if, uh, is there an exception case for that? Is that going to help our, our deployment? Does the NRI format allow for new filters, new IP filters, de dependency between filters, and this new wonderful concept of groups and maybe even subgroups? Um, that is why we're doing four uh, initial groups. I'm hoping we get enough filters to, to start implementers with a good basic. And uh, the last questions deal with erroring. What happens if there's an error in the parsing of the LRI TLV? What sort of error do we take? Do we simply say uh, 
uh, toss all of the uh, TOVs, uh, skip this one. What happens if the errors are detected when the machine tries to put the filter in and the action? What happens if you think you're filtering by bytes, but, uh, excuse me, if you're doing a uh, mirror after uh, or a copy and you can't do it, uh, that might make a difference if you're going to do a copy and drop with a DOS. Are the validity checks sufficient in the current one? FlowSpec V1 um, in the V1 for IPv4 and the V1 for IPv6 and the inter-AS editions did a lot of checks to make sure validity was correct. So those are questions I'd like to try to pick up uh, in next week to see if we can even get some initial f feedback on that. Just in case you're new to it, and I'm glad to have new people, this is a picture of the flow spec rules. The rules really are grouped by flow spec type. And the type first type we're looking at is the IP types. And under that, you might have a whole bunch of rules. Now, they can, uh, that's how the flow specs are grouped in the NRI. In the actual implementation, it could be that they're grouped by order. But what they're grouped in the LRI is they're grouped by type. And then the rules each have an order number. So this is the top, this is the database that's being passed by the NRI. As a database for order, your order would come at the top. So please let me, this, this description here is trying to help you understand the LRI. There's an order and there's identifier, which for right now is logging because you might have many rules and say this is for uh, this customer or this is this type of rule. The identifier is there because I imagine we may need to have some sort of uh, non-order number that identifies a specific rule. Then you have an, a rule match condition with a type, and the type is really your component, a match operator, match value, uh, variable, and a match value. The actions have an order as well once we get beyond the basic, and there is an operator, a variable, and an action. And some people suggested an action name, but that isn't in the situation. So this was our original uh, design of the NRI. Let's see what it looks like in bytes. That may be easier. You have an NRI length with a whole bunch of TLVs. And the way we decided to group things was to group it by basic types. We would say, here's a set of types for filter rules. Here's perhaps if you wanted to only have a basic set of filter rules and then have an extended set that you agree to implement, we might break it there. Everything beyond number one, uh, we've got designs for, but we're open to talk about there's an L2 traffic rules, which you'll see in the L2 VPN. The SFC traffic rules, which um, right now the traffic rules for SFC are only uh, in the IP filters. There are only SFC traffic rules with actions. The VPN traffic rules for SFC. So these uh, types are what Donald and I thought might be uh, good. And we can talk about them, and that's why we need uh, feedback. The identifier is, again, a uh, logging ID that or uh, an ID that might track to some sort of logging. We have the filter type, IP basic, the length of TLVs, and the values. So the value is really a set of components. The value, if you notice here, is just a set of component TLVs, which you had in. Go ahead, Jeff. Did I drop off my mic again? 
Yep, you're still good. You finish up and then you have a comment on the slide after that. Okay. The components are right now flow spec V1 plus TTL. That seemed to be a basic need that people had. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I'm. Uh, so one of the things I went to raise as a point of visibility for the participants here. So we're discussing the NLRI. The identifier in here, I think you've given you know, a good example of what you're hoping to use this for. The challenge that we have for this, and I'm going to give the example of interface set uh, that we'll talk about, I'm sure, a little bit later. Uh, when we did the work for interface set, we intentionally put it into the path attributes because it needed a flavor of mutability. Um, the second motivation for it is that, is it really relevant to the you know, key information that's being passed around the LRI? For flow spec, the way we're currently largely operating is that uh, the stuff that's inside of the NLRI is mostly match criteria. So when we look at uh, the stuff here, uh, identifier is a little bit on the strange side of things because while it's still useful to have a strong pairing of it for the operations purposes, what you end up having the question of is, is this uh, identifier intended to count as against the NLRI key? And we do actually have examples out of like eVPN and VPN, et cetera, or even the car these days, where not everything inside of NLRI must be part of the key. So the point I think will deserve discussion over you know, the longer term is, do we want this identifier in the key? Do we want the keys, to, you know, stuff in the NLRI to always be part of the key? Or is this something that uh, even though it has good use, maybe belongs pulled out into some path attributes? And therein lies it. The order we set in our uh, flow spec V1 discussion is absolute key because we want to have all the order filters, whether it's IP filters or L2 VPN filters or MPLS filters, the order of those filters need uh, that's set by the user is the top key. We want that to be, that way you can efficiently set groups of filters uh, based on the order. Then you can send a type for uh, flow spec uh, V2 uh, IP uh, followed by uh, another one with L2 VPN and still keep the ordering complete. You don't have to, uh, so the order becomes a key and then the type becomes a key. After that, the co components become the key. The reason I put in identifier there is that sometimes the reports that I've read on flow spec uh, deployments is making sure out of 10,000 filters or 5,000 filters that you have a common set of filters across orders may be necessary. So it's, it's one of the questions we have. It's one that the initial discussion seemed to say, okay. So I hope there will be questions about this from implementers. We've tried to ask this question quite a lot because we're interested in getting the base. So what does the a component number look like? Well, this is flow spec V1, where you went from IP destination to IP source to IP V4 protocol or IP upper protocol port destination source. Uh, TCP flags, flag link, DSC, fragment, flow length, TTL. Those are the ones, the TTL is the only one added from the flow spec V1 uh, because it seemed to be something basic across. The non-IP uh, uh, components, and we, we park the parts of the SID with the non-IP. I'm not sure that's where it really should have been. Maybe that should be in the extended IP filters. Um, any thoughts on that would be helpful. Um, uh, 
Uh, so one of the things that's worth mentioning here, uh, the component numbers in the current flow spec rules for how the rules are sorted into the firewall, because you know, firewalls are ordered, partially is based off of you know the component IDs. So the fact that uh, the stuff that's up here, 1 through 13 for IP component numbers is what we currently have in flow spec v1, that set of rule ordering was appropriate for DDoS use cases. You know, as an example, you know, destination address as a match is the highest you know, precedence, source is next, etc. And for DDoS, that's been a very uh, natural set of fits. Uh, let's use TTL, which is uh, listed here as 14 as a proposal, uh, as a thing to illustrate where some of this could be a headache. If you're looking at where this probably should sort in terms of precedence and importance in a firewall, TTL probably belongs somewhere very close up front, you know, near components, you no know, one, two, and three. So the question is, where do you put it? You know, I, arguably, you could probably put it uh, somewhere before one. Uh, some people might argue it's supposed to be after two. I, I think there'll be some good discussion around uh, where such things go, because part of what we'll have to do is come up with what the natural sort order is. But what this also shows is that if you only have one byte in flow spec v1 uh, for doing these components, the ordering becomes sort of problematic because at some point you'll decide you have something that is important enough that you may want to sort it ahead of some things. And if you already have things laid out as we have for you know, 1 through 4, uh, 13 here uh, and you know, 0 and 255 are reserved, well, then it's somewhat problematic of where does this go? Uh, so a discussion point for flow spec v2 is not only what should the component numbers be by the function that we're trying to accomplish here, but also uh, how do we want to also maybe change the component numbers themselves. So we'll get to that in upcoming slides about uh, you know component width and also explicit ordering. So one way of, since Jeff's mentioned this, one of the things that the implementer said is I want you to say with the IP basic rules so I can deploy my current existing filters uh, with user ordering. Okay, let's say we do that and we keep upward cap capability, but we really decide that these filter rules aren't what we wanted. So maybe we go with a new set of component orders. Uh, there is a lot of room in the filter type. So we really um, need to know, do we give, we got a real strong, I want something simple that I can just add to flow spec V1 and have user ordering. Give me that so that I know I have a basic functionality and then we thought, well, maybe you need to have an, a new type of filter ordering, okay, that, that, that doesn't. Now, why are we focused on the components? For people who are new, the component numbers uh, have been in flow spec V1. The ordering, if you have a single default and flow spec v1 has no user ordering so all the components uh the component orders provided a way to order the filters so your dis destination prefix filters are followed by ip source filters if you skip one that's okay you would go from ip destination to port to destination port but we may want to have another set of component numbers. We may want to blend uh, SIDs uh, at it. So we need some strong feedback. Uh, Donald and I tried to get a lot of feedback, but sometimes um, the new applications we see now are bringing uh, with uh, uh, Savvy and CATS and APN and the L2V uh, debt net work that has timing plus L2. It seems like a place where people are looking for things. Um, and the SRV6 uh, header uh, is really important. So 
Uh, think about all of that. I'd like you to review it. And we really need to discuss if we have the basics. And we can go to the basics and have a new type saying uh, this is the V types. And the ordering of the types is still uh, for the numbering on those types is still fluid other than the number one is is the IP basics. Okay, now any questions on the filtering or user ordering? Okay, let me go on to our next headache, which is the extended communities. The extended communities um, right now have been very active in getting flow spec v2 actions we've had a lot of requests for new actions the extended communities have put it into three various types one is the generic transitive extended community one's the ipv4 transitive extended community and there's the transitive ipv6 and i'll give you the list of those shortly the other idea is that there's a community path attribute that we can take a new type and make it simply uh, a flow spec V2 type and make that user ordering with the same sort of TLVs for the actions. So I'm going to drop into that um, just to make sure I've mentioned that uh, one more time that flow spec V1 filters and flow spec uh, V2 filters are ships in the night. And there is an inherent proposed ordering, which is rules uh, that's probably best expressed in a set of rules. Rule zero, um, which is the uh, base condition, is that you permit traffic going through a router's firewall. That's the baseline. And then these rules in flow spec V1 were added to restrict traffic. That uh, comes from the background of the DDoS. Rule N to the end. Uh, so we, we thought the best way to do it is to break this with, um, with, the, with the rule for the flow spec V2 at the beginning, since clearly if the user had an order, we would think he probably wants that first because he's done that. And that the flow spec V1 rules would start at such number and then uh, be at a single user order, since that's the definition of flow spec V1. And if it has the same user order, then the component number follows. And if it has, according to flow spec v1, the same user order and component, then a multiple of components uh, provide the ordering within a component. The ordering may be interesting if you're not deep into flow spec v1 order, which says order first by component and then order within a component based on the definition uh, given by the component. This all goes back to that original package. So how does this, why are we so focused on chaining uh, and uh, the problems? As you see, we don't have that many actions uh, that are listed by IANA. A lot more are proposed. But these actions can interact. For example, the traffic rate uh, by byte versus the traffic rate by packet. The uh, redirects, we have four or five different types of redirects. And uh, we have a flow spec classifier. Uh, those are all in extended community. We also have a DSCP marking. And then we have pat traffic actions, which uh, can give various uh, terminal terms, uh, say this is the last of the flow spec actions, and if any more come, ignore it, or copy uh, the packet. So these generic uh, transitive communities were really uh, sort of created 
to handle multiple formats of the flow spec extended community, but also perhaps some uh, loose specs initially. The transitive for the V6 is much, uh, the transitive extended communities for the V4 show our newer types with an interface set, uh, the redirect mirror and redirect to a generic indirection ID, which might be to MPLS or SRV6 or something else. So we need to, in the action group, sort of sort through these actions in extended community, talk about what happens if and how they interact, and then talk about what's the way to make sure they're sanely ordered. Now, the V6 um, comes to just a redirect flag and has, again, two redirects. So we've got to really dig into the redirects because we've got lots of different specs and they're not always uh, independent. And this is the V6 spec. Any questions from new people on this? How am I doing, uh, Gerard, or those uh, other people who've deployed it? Nat, am I giving you the background on this you need? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you. Oh, good. Uh, Gerard's been at this, uh, Jared's been at this uh, for a long time. Okay, why was I suggesting for actions we might want to look at dependency? Well, you know, if we, one of the complaints about V1 is the filters uh, we couldn't put user ordering on. And there were two pro three problems with the actions. You couldn't do user order. You couldn't really uh, tell how the interactions were going. And you couldn't tell what happens with the failures. So we needed user ordering, um, uh, interactions, failure, and dependency. So like this, when you have four things that need to change, It, Jeff, I think I just dropped off the... Uh, you lost your uh, headset again. Okay, I'm going to back out. Feel free to comment on this actions while I make it uh, pick up again. Thank you. Back. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, partially covering the prior slide, but leading into the motivations for this slide. Uh, so using interface set as a example, uh, when the group that was working on the interface set feature, uh, who also had done some of the work on redirect IP, was discussing how, how do these things all in interact with each other? And interface set is a little bit more of a from action rather than a targeting action. Uh, you know, it becomes a from activity rather than you know, a, a to. Uh, so not quite comparable. For the two ones, though, we look at the redirects. We have you know, redirect IP as an example and redirect diverf. Well, what happens when you actually have you know, both of these present at the same time? You know, is, is that an intention of what you're really trying to do? And we spent a little bit of time uh, debating this amongst ourselves when we did the original specification. Uh, the text that we eventually settled on was that if uh, redirect diverf and redirect IP were both present, we wanted uh, the activity to be perceived as you know, the redirection is done as the IP lookup in the context of the targeted verf. The headache that you have is that with these things being sent in using separate extended communities, among other things, what happens if you hit an implementation that can't do that? And you know, sort of in fairness to where we're at in terms of the uh, process, um, for redirect IP, you know, we, we had actually looked at removing that combination action, because out of the three vendors that uh, had been participating in the original work, nobody ended up implementing you know, the combo behavior, although we had a request from a specific operator that they actually are interested in that. But it gives an easy example that even though we have combo actions, if they're specified in separable elements, well, what do you actually mean in that case? You know, if it has to be interpreted in terms of the combo of do the IP lookup in the verf, 
split communities, you know, uh, where one had prior meaning, isn't probably the right way to go. A new community set that can say that uh, these things belong together, which is where Sue is sort of heading inside of her uh, redirect components a little bit later in. Uh, to be able to tie the things together, well, that's perhaps another option. But fundamentally, what we're looking at is when you have the things that do chain together for some strange reason, how do they get represented in the protocol as an action? And what happens if you either can't carry out the entirety of the action? I gave the example of redirect IP in a verf. Um, that's one that you probably don't want to take action, and therefore the rule might actually be skipped. Alternatively, you know, maybe some devices will implement it one way and some devices could implement another. So this means that actions might need to have the ability to selectively run depending on their deployment. And certainly that adds complexity, especially since original flow spec is supposed to be very simple. It's supposed to be able to be uh, distributed through the domain through a route reflector is one of the possible deployment models. So you get up with headaches about how these things could go. Uh, so the action bundling and potentially doing them in a conditional fashion is part of uh, where Sue's slides are taking us as a discussion point. Sue, you're back. So, so if you can hear me, why don't I go ahead and actually do the slide sharing? Can you hear me at this I can, point? I can okay. hear you. Why, why don't I go ahead and actually do the slide sharing just to simplify yep. the uh, that piece of the problem? And to, yeah, happy uh, um, problem. New one for me. Okay. I am almost on the right slide. Uh, slide 20, I believe. Yeah, it's slide 20. So one problem we had with the failure modes, let's see if I can, okay, is what happens we, we had problems again with the order dependency within a chain. There are in V1, there was no default order and there was no default interactions and each implementation tried to uh, deal with that. The implementations specific ordering is what we have today. Implementations in a particular network seem to work, but different there is no really uh, specified uh, action inter order, interaction. It was sort of like, these are the global actions. So you have problems when you have dependencies or you need specific interactions and you go from different carriers. Now, the original group of implementations for FlowSpec V1 did a lot of testing. However, as we move to v2, we really want to have order dependency based on a user order. Um, default ordering if you're using extended communities and failure handling. What happens when an individual action fails? If you have copy and uh, then drop uh, so that you can capture a filter what happens if the copy fails or if you have a rate limit before you forward what happens if the rate limiting fails do you simply stop on failure do you continue do you continue if it's conditional or like in the configuration do you do it all or nothing we have had some interesting discussions on this but we really uh, didn't get to it because most people said, okay, I just want the user ordering for the filters because I'm still doing implementation specific ordering, but I'm running into problem because I can't order my filters. 
So for the initial IP um, filtering, uh, this dependency might say, yep, keep on with the implementation. But as they roll forward, perhaps they want to handle uh, ordering uh, based on a default that we have in the draft, based on defaulted interactions. Uh, again, the default, the easiest way is to number it and say, uh, number the extended community actions and have you go by number. But that's a real discussion. And these sort of problems are why I think we're going to be talking a great deal about uh, the actions in FlowSpec V2. Jeff, did you have another comment or am I off mic again? Nope, you're good. Uh, so uh, one comment before we roll forward next slide or you know, open other questions, an example of when stop makes and maybe does not make sense. Uh, so you know, my employer's uh, implementation for FlowSpec, we have some platforms that don't support the ability to set DSCP. So the question becomes, you know, what do you do in circumstances where you receive a rule you know, that contains an action that you, you cannot implement? You know, do you propagate the rule and the hope that somebody else further in the network can do so? Uh, do you locally ignore the action? You know, uh, and especially if you have more than one action, if you can't accomplish some of them, you know, as an example, maybe you want to do a uh, rate limit and also set DSCP. Well, perhaps if DSCP can't be supported, doing the rate limit itself is okay. So that's an example of separable rule sets uh, that uh, you have to decide how we want to signal that. Thanks, Sue. Thanks. Uh, any questions? This may be drinking from a large uh, a review because we've been working a while on FlowSpec V2, Donald, and some of the input we had from our co-authors who are uh, working in uh, networks hopefully got us to a certain place. Jeff is, but there's a lot of new applications you all are working on and it's exciting for us to get new feedback. Okay. What are our scalability in inter and aspirations? Uh, first of all, there are three or four protocols that could put filters out. There's BGP, there's NetConf, there's ResConf, there's PCE, and there are other ones that I probably don't know. I see that um, some of the new uh, work for uh, Savvy or uh, uh, CATS or for APM may be looking at other ways. Well, what we, one of the early foundational discussions we had is to realize what BGP is and what BGP isn't, um, especially when you look at filters. BGP is a multicast distribution. You, you have a, a forwarding distribution through peers which send the flows. So you might think of that if you have de, uh, denial of service attacks like little bugs going through your network, that BGP is a spray repellent. You know, you spray it everywhere and uh, it covers things and you just spray and hope it kills off all the the bugs and and because it most because it goes out there and gets installed quickly that the repellent really kills off the denial of service attacks it is not a swat like you swat a fly or a insect you know, with a with a uh, with a piece of paper or something it's it's not action reply. You don't swat and get a f uh, and lift up your fly swatter and find that the denial of service is dead. Um, PCE does a nice reply response swat, and that's okay. And NetConf can do a uh, a reply response or reply in publication. Uh, those are all good tools, but turning BGP into something that's different than a multicast distribution is probably not going to be real se uh, sensible. And BGP flow spec V2 as a multicast uh, distribution is extremely powerful. 
uh, adding to NetConf or PCE or some other protocol with specific uh, reply responses better than trying to turn BGP into one of those. And that's been our uh, chair and author uh, basic aspirations. Um, some of the drafts I see go to that, and I want to hear more about from the authors why you go into to that, because we found that's not necessarily successful in the past. Go ahead, Jeff. Yep. Uh, just before we advance, one of the things I do want to mention here is that, uh, well, deploying flow spec largely through our reflector is one of the common deployment mechanisms. Targeted BGP sessions to individual devices and setting uh, the no advertise community is also another common deployment mechanism for some deployments. Yes, and that is a targeted multicast uh, versus a sort of wide uh, dispersal. So that would be your uh, bug spray uh, pointed at a particular place. Um, BGP sex, LRI could be passed in BGP sec, but what I've learned about BGP sec is don't assume we could go there quickly, uh, but it is po it's possible to send this NRI in, in BGP sec, but um, ROAs might be a much quicker way to help the filters. But again, in, in BGP sec row trade-offs, you have to uh, um, make your choices and work and decide that it's worth the effort. Next one. Uh, quick uh, interjection here. So BGP sec is intentionally not specified for anything besides IPv4 IPv6 unicast. I, I know we sort of uh, scraped at the point that BGP sec might need to be improved to handle other address families as part of doing the CT card work. Uh, so that's one aspect here. Second aspect is that uh, currently those mechanisms for BGP sec are only covering uh, destinations themselves. So that is an, correct. Yeah. So as an example, um, applying uh, the lookups you know, for validations, part of the core you know, flow spec uh, procedures. A lot of people have to shut that off for various reasons. Being able to apply ROAS to it is you know, certain, something, something we'd probably be recommending these days. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some requests for features for that uh, as part of the flow spec v2 work, uh, as you have here. Um, but I, th I think BGP sec is going to be a very challenging discussion for this. Yes. And we found that when I did the deep dive for CAR and CT. So what do I need some really help for? Uh, and we may, um, one of the impressive uh, presentations, I was reading through all the presentations for ITF and reading through drafts on APN and CAT and SAFNET and L2. And Jeff and I had discussions with with many of these people at ITF 119 is we really need to hear from these new use cases. You know, uh, it would be good if you had one of these use cases and I will be reaching out to folks who um, have joined today to ask about summaries from ATN, from CAT, from SAFNET. And if you're, an operator and you're working with uh, denial of service and we've missed something there, uh, I'm going to ask what needs to be in a filter rule. You know, uh, what in these new use cases needs to be a filter rule? Uh, what are we missing? Are we looking for something for SRV6? Are we looking for this? What actions need to be happening? And one of the curiosities I have is there a grouping function? If there is, does flow spec v2 need to write a group ID? And if you write a group ID, does a later filter need to take an action on it? That's that's an interesting set. And um, maybe there's a, a, a really neat thing from Shuping's uh, APN presentation at ITF, which I've, I've put in this list, uh, in the um, presentations for this interim, is is 
the maybe a, a second group and does the user ordering design work for this filter and that's the first thing have we got the user ordering because with the user ordering at the top of the key we've got to say that we think we've got it right and how can you do that if you've got that and i'll be tagging many of you with email uh today and tomorrow and say you know would you be willing to answer these four questions and bring them along uh and speak about them um next week because we need to find out if the ordering's working we can start the bcp uh, ip basic filters and we'd like to think we have something fairly solid uh, but we could create additional filters it's the ordering that we're trying to get to jeff did you have any comments on this anyone i've forgotten i i think this is you know the core of the things and you know some of this is uh i gotta pick on uh Safnet a little bit more directly than you know probably deserves. Uh, there, there have been other proposals where this overlaps. There have been situations where uh, flow spec has been used as a way to represent the encoding for things about matching traffic uh, that is not specifically intended to be firewall-like behavior. So an example for Savnet is that you, you could sort of treat source address validation as a firewall type activity, but doesn't necessarily have to be encoded that fashion. Uh, we have a proposal you know, that uh, went its way through PSEP where they borrowed our encodings and use that for their own traffic filters. So they're, they're taking advantage of it for you know, matching criteria. And even in just sort of boring flow spec, uh, we had a prior proposal at one point where the forwarding mechanism was not actually via the firewall, but it was using flow spec to actually match things and do destination-based forwarding. So it was basically influencing the rib. So I, I think that... Uh, we have a lot of use cases where we have sort of a uh, tension between some of the uh, behaviors we're looking for. You know, one example being very much firewall-like behaviors, some of them being uh, uh, packet classification behaviors that use firewall-type formats, and you know, some of the hybrids in between. Danny? So I'm going to, I, I'm going to ask many of you to come and share this next week because we are stuck if i if i get through the rest of the slides i think due to my headset we may be uh not enough time to see some of the interesting presentations we had at itf uh, please take a look at some of them and we start with that with a uh matrix of these new applications, the new filters, and some of them are new filters which are beyond in the payload. That's critical to know that we're also looking there. Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Uh, and these are the design team questions. Um, these are more with the seven questions I I had given you earlier, there are things I'd like to ask you to uh, find out. Um, you know, we need to, as design team one, setting this very basic, seek out the use cases described by other design teams. So they'll be online. Uh, I uh, People have looked to say, I want to work on the basic i want to work on the filters and maybe nothing else or i want to work on the basic and actions so you'll see people joining very thing it might be good even to read the presentations even if you're not active uh, and so that's why i showed you the places i need uh new feedback um and the group and links to interfaces as Safnet had is critical. Go ahead. Uh, these are questions I'd like you to read and decide, can you help or if nothing else, listen and help us think together. What happens if multiple FlowSpec filters are used with the same user order? 
should we use component types uh, and it is common? Uh, what happens, uh, should the component types be common? What I've got in v, flow spec V2 is they're common uh, types between V4 and V6 and sort of a translation. Uh, if you see the component here, it works like this for V4, it works like this for V6. Should we order component types for other layers? How does this component default ordering within the same order break down? We're in flow spec uh, basic filters. We may, uh, based on the request we had from implementers, stay with the flow spec V1 component ordering, but maybe in extended filters, we want to take another uh, ordering within the filters. And Jeff and I have use cases, so I will be sending out, uh, posting to the wiki and other things, use cases for each of these questions. So you'll see a, both a link on the uh, wiki and email traffic on some of these questions. Go ahead. So how does the LRI format for user ordering allow for additions. Can we add the payload? I had a very interesting denial of service uh, discussion with a new participant and uh, that talked about needing payloads and gave a really good use case. There's a DetNet draft for FlowSpec that says, I wanna have an L2 header and time. Will we be looking at time for L3 headers? How much dependency can be expressed? For example, in some of the firewalls you have, uh, if filter one matches, skip to filter two. Why do they have that? Uh, because it's effective. If I match on this source address, then I can look to see if that source address comes from uh, interface one. Uh, I then don't want to do something. So there's dependencies between filters and actions. Can we handle creating group tags and testing? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, excuse me. Uh, can we handle groups and interfaces? Jeff, am I still on my same main sound? Yep, you're still good. Good. Uh, something's odd with the uh, uh, browser today. Uh, can we handle quick addition of new filters? If we have a denial of service box that goes ahead and generates filters, can we go and it, it's, it's taking in mirroring and it's uh, scraping through things and looking at things and it decides it wants a new filter. Can we install a new filter? How and where can we install if we have user ordering um, how do we let someone quickly insert a, a new filter up at the front? Do they have to reorder? How do we leave? Can we leave gaps? Can we put something like there? Notice there's a lot of order space. Do we suggest to people common practices? Your user order should, should uh, basic order should be done in tens or twenties. So you have a, a case to do that. Some of that, uh, best practices might help as well. Uh, again, lots of input if you're on a on a operational if you're designing. Go ahead. And what happens if errors are detected? Now this is switches from functionality to what happens if something breaks because one of the problems they had was filters. Uh, didn't work. And first we fixed uh, BGP uh, handling uh, in the RFC 7606 and concept is treat of withdrawal or some other things. How should we deal with a filter format? Should we say uh, this filter is broken, but we're going to accept uh, the right uh, another, uh, the filter in the, in the stream, if we have another LRI and what sort of errors are possible? What happens if you have an error 
with one filter and it has a dependency on the other. Um, that's just some of the things Donald and I have talked about. Donald, um, did I miss anything on here on air on filterings or maybe when I get through a couple more, you can tell me if I miss something. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so go ahead to the next. What happens if errors are detected when users are filled? Again, Jeff and I have given you the case where what happens if you can't put a filter in? You can't scan for SRV6, but you've asked for that to be in uh, the first, the highest user priority. Uh, it's because this machine doesn't do SRV6 or SR headers or um, what do we do then? Uh, BGP, this is the case where BGP is a uh, spray to either the whole network or spray to a set of things. You're not going to get a reply back. Um, how do we log? Do we log it and, tr and encourage people to have a... Uh, uh, a, a logging error come back through the netconf uh, pub sub that might be a very effective because a pub sub uh, that's a publication uh, subscription uh, model might be really quick to get it back to a centralized denial of service. Um, what about the interaction? Should BGP flag this problem? Should we make sure to get a Yang model quickly along with this? This is all part of the whole solution rather than just the NLRIs in the box. Okay, next one, Jeff. Are validity checks from FlowSpec V1 sufficient? And I, I, I spent a lot of time as an author reviewing uh, and uh, as an editor on, uh, as a shepherd on RFC 9117, checking the validations for the flow spec v1 and and making sure that you could check the validations the first two have strong validations and the 119 provides some looseness inside of a single uh administrative domain for flow spec but if any of you has any indications that these flow specs uh validity checks now the validity text is difficult to read because it's very specific but if you if you have some like uh, job or uh, uh, or nat well, oh great yep it's happened again <laughs> okay i'm wondering what if, I'm you have, I'm wondering if you're having some weak batteries <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering if my batteries in my headset need to be replaced. Okay, drafts to read for next time. Um, if I'm even uh, light, uh, I think we're just going to try to not go in and out. If you're in this list and you don't want to be a contacted, let me know because I'm going to send notes out. And I think with that, Jeff, we're just, I'm just going to say, folks, I'm going to send email to all participants. Please read the questions. Please look at these drafts, and I'll send more details out. I think that's the end of the slides, Jeff. Go ahead. Yep, and to sort of add into here, the, the motivation for listing the cluster of drafts is that you know, the base flow spec protocol work has to serve as, you know, a framework and a skeleton that we can hang all these additional features on top of in an extensible fashion. Clearly, not every single device is going to implement everything. We just need to make sure that uh, the protocol is capable of accommodating things in a clear fashion. Uh, the critical things, to my mind at least, as they start, as Sue has touched on, is 
ordering, especially implicit rule orders, uh, become challenging if there's no holes to insert to do things into. We have the TTL example we gave for you know, basic IP is one place of that. Uh, Sue is listed a large number of drafts here that have different applications that want to use FlowSpec either for explicit traffic filtering or pattern matching. So we're looking to have everybody uh, that's looking to add a feature into FlowSpec you know, for her design team one uh, to make sure to review the, you know, the core protocol uh, discussions that we're having in terms of how would your component fit into these things and how it would interrelate with other pieces. And as we get into actions as well, you know, the, the sort of two things we're looking for, uh, again, to my mind, is here are the things that uh, we're looking to take as actions. Are these things severable or not? You know, can they be done, you know, part or must they be done as a whole? Uh, and in circumstances where more than one action is severable, you know, what should the behaviors be done if uh, they, you know, what action can be done and another one cannot? Did I catch everything, Sue? Yes, you did. And again, I apologize for the mic at this point. Um, please, thanks for all your work. I'll be talk. I'll be sending messages to everyone who attended. If you, if it was just interested and you don't want to, just let me know you're uh, not interested, and I'll go on. Please join anytime. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Shuping. Bye, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.